Experience Life, what's up? Good to see you. Also, want to give a special shout out to those of you watching at church online or in one of our video services. We're so glad that you're here today with us as well. I don't know how many of you guys were here last weekend, but Easter at Experience Life 2011 was like off the chain amazing, all right? I mean, it, we had an all time high in, in attendance and, and just life changing stories, just absolutely unbelievable. Some of you guys, I may have been here. I know people were asking, uh, you know, hey, how many people did you have? Because, like, I was in a line all the way out to 82nd Street, all right? Like, I was fixing to get hit by a car, all right? So I know some people were in lines out front. But just so you know, for those of you that have wanted to know, last weekend we had 4,680 people join us for Easter. which is awesome, and I told you a couple weeks ago, one thing we were so afraid of was having to turn people away, and at the five o'clock service, there were a few children that we didn't have enough room, so they came with their parents, but overall, five services, we didn't turn anybody away last weekend, which we were really excited about. And, and here's kind of the, the co coolest part about all of that, is that when all the counting is done, and you know, we had thousands of cards because everybody filled out a card last weekend, but. When all the counting is done, when all the calling is done to people that were interested in committing their lives to Christ, it looks like we're going to have over 500 commitments to Christ from last weekend. Like, you can thank Jesus for that, because that's amazing. I mean, I've, I've always dreamed of being able to be a part of something like that. Never, never thought I'd actually be able to be. And so it was, I mean, just absolutely phenomenal. And it would not have happened without our volunteers. Like, as, as, you know, all areas, but like children's ministry, some, you know, usually go every other week and they went weekly because of Easter, didn't want us to turn uh, kids away due to a lack of volunteers. Some of them served like two, three, four services on Easter. So volunteers, all areas, thank you. Like you made it happen. All right. So. Our volunteers are amazing. We also announced last weekend that our volunteers in Servolution served over 6,000 hours in our community, which was great. And then we got to um, start our series called At the Movies, which is uh, what we're in still today for this weekend and next weekend. This is part two of At the Movies. And basically in this series, for those of you that are like, movies and church, what do those have to do with each other? Uh, we're taking some popular movies that have been released in the last couple of years and talking about spiritual applications that can be drawn from them. All right, so just so you know, if you're looking online for the movies, we, due to copyright reasons, we cannot post these online, all right? So like last weekend, we posted like my clips of speaking like between the movie clips and it, it like pieced it together and I'm sure it made no sense to anybody who watched that wasn't there for the movies. It's like, who's Michael? Anyways, and so uh, we may put my part online, but just so you know, this weekend, next weekend will not be online, the movie clips, so you'll definitely want to be here uh, next weekend as we conclude the series. Last weekend, we showed the movie Blindside, which is a great movie, and this weekend, the movie that we've chosen to talk about is a movie, you might have heard of it before, maybe, maybe, called Avatar. <laughs> How many of you guys have seen Avatar? How many of you guys have seen it in 3D with the glasses? You weren't trying to look hip or get a date that night, obviously, because those glasses, but... All right, so you've seen it before. Interesting show, good show, you know, graphically unbelievable, really. So we're going to talk about it. So you're like, I, I mean, this is going to be interesting to see where you go with this. But anyways, and so uh, we're going to show a clip, talk some, show a clip, talk some. That's kind of our format in this series. So let's go. First clip. So if you're taking notes, grab a program that you got when you came in. You grab a pen uh, there that's in, in your chair. But just as Jake uh, gets into this tank and is transformed and kind of becomes a new creature in a similar way, sort of. <laughs> Y'all track with me, all right, we're trying. When, here's the point, here's this, and this is uh, truth right from the word of God. When we commit our lives to Christ, we become new people. The Bible teaches that, you can mark that down. When we commit our lives to Christ, we become new people. We talked some last weekend about why it's so important to commit your life to Christ, how to make that decision. This weekend, we're looking a little bit beyond that and talking about what happens when you make it. Like, what's, what's next? First thing, when you commit your life to Christ, we become new people. The Bible says this. If you got a Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to be in a couple of places through these clips. 2 Corinthians 5. It's on page 212 if you're in the blue ones. 212. And if you don't have a Bible, if it's not a translation you understand very well, we'd love to give you one of these. Like it's on us. You can pick one up on your way out. 
Uh, if you're watching online, definitely you can, you can call us, whatever, we'll mail you one, but we want you to have a Bible and an easy to understand translation. This is New Testament. So uh, page 212 here, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, this is Paul speaking. He, he says this, he says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new what? Person. See, I wasn't making it up. Y'all like, you're making that up. No, any, anybody, he says, who belongs to Christ has, uh, has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. So when you commit your life to Christ, the Bible teaches you become a new person. And some people listen, you know, listen to that, read that and go like, what is that supposed to mean? Like new person, like what changes? Like what, what, what's new about me when I commit my life to Christ? It's simply this, and then this has huge implications, right? When you commit your life to Christ, God himself, like God the Holy Spirit comes into your life and takes up residence there. When you commit your life to Christ, you get the Holy Spirit and like God, like God himself takes up residence in your life. And because that happens, things start to change. You can imagine, like, like things change when God comes into your life and begins to convict you, guide you, prompt you as to how we're supposed to live. Now, start talking about the Holy Spirit. Some people get confused. They're like, is that ghost? Was that in the goat? Was that Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit? Basically, throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit brings completion. God the Holy Spirit brings completion to the work planned by God the Father and started by God the Son, like Jesus. That's his role. He brings it to completion. So in salvation, God the Father plans it, right? He plans to save people by sending his Son, Jesus, who starts this work, and dies on the cross for our sins, rise from the dead on the third day, forgiving those who repent of their sin, put their faith in him. And then the Holy Spirit, when we make that decision, applies it to our lives. That's, that's kind of how he works. He brings uh, to completion things planned by God the Father, started by God the Son. So when he comes and takes up residence in our life, things change and, and obviously some things are going to start to happen. You're going to start to bear, according to the Bible, some fruit. The call, Bible calls it fruit of the Spirit. You can find it in Galatians 5. But here are some of the things, if God's living inside of you, all right, that are going to start to come out. Fruit of the Spirit, list them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Like these things should become more evident in our lives because God himself has taken up residence in our lives. And these are things that the Bible says the Holy Spirit produces in us. Let's look at a few of them more closely. Like love, love, joy, peace, love. See, human nature, tell me if this isn't true. Human nature is to love those that love us, right? Human nature is to love those that are like us. Human nature is to love those that are going to help us get ahead in life. But is that how God loves? Is that how God loves? No, God loves everybody unconditionally, even the unlovable, even those we wouldn't maybe be as likely to love. So if God takes up residence in you and he starts to love through you, then you're going to start to love a lot more like God than like our human nature would like us to love. You, tra you tracking with that? Because God's in us, he's producing that kind of love in us, which is great for our friends, great for our family members, great for our society, if we start to love like God, rather than like we typically would just in and of ourselves. So like love, he produces that, a God kind of love, an agape, unconditional kind of love in our lives. Love, joy, like joy in our lives, like knowing, because the Holy Spirit resides within us, knowing that our sins are completely forgiven. I mean, what's so cool last week, and as you guys know, is 500 people, about, maybe a little more, walked out of this place knowing for sure their sins were forgiven. Does that bring joy into your life? Is that, is that kind of exciting? That, that's exciting. That, no, no question about it. So joy in knowing your sins are forgiven, joy in knowing that you've got a spot prepared for you in heaven because you've committed your life to Christ. Like also joy, like we talked about last week, and knowing that God's plans for you are better than your plans for you, that he's got a great plan for your life. Does that bring you joy knowing, man, my plans are all jacked up, but God's got a great plan for me? Yeah, of course. So love, joy, because of his presence in our life. Peace, peace. Like you don't have to worry about anything because your dad is in control of everything. That's good news, right? Like peace, knowing, hey, God lives in me and he's in control of everything. So why do I have to worry about anything? I can, have, I can have peace. I'm right with God and he's in control. So the Bible says that when you commit your life to Christ, these things start to come out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the, the whole list. Fruit of the Spirit. Other things the Holy Spirit does in us is he convicts us. 
He convicts us when we're thinking about or starting to head in the wrong direction, which by the way, church, we should be very thankful for. You know, a lot of times, I don't know if you're like me, but we can despise God when he convicts us like, God, you're just trying to keep me from having fun. I can't even believe you'd tell me not to do that. Whereas the axiom that we've presented to you guys so many times here is that God's not trying to keep us from having fun. He's trying to protect us from getting hurt. He's trying to keep, remember that. That'll change the way you live. He, he doesn't give you these commands or, hey, you go this way because he's trying to keep us from having fun. He's trying to protect us from getting hurt. So he convicts us when we're heading the wrong direction so that we know that and we can begin to head in the direction that he wants us uh, to go. Another thing he does is he guides us in the decisions that we make. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he comes and lives in us. He guides us through life, through the decisions that we make. I mean, think about this, church, think about this. How great would your decisions be in life if they were primarily guided by God? Uh, you'd be making some good decisions, wouldn't you say? You make some good decisions. That's why when I came to understand this, I have a time in uh, you know, my, my prayer time each day, the time I spend with the Lord, it's just called decision prayer time. And basically, and you can do this too, I list every decision I have that's coming up. And every single day I pray about it. I say, God, you know, you know much more than me about this life thing. Like, you know everything. Like, would you help me in these decisions I have coming up? Like, the Holy Spirit inside of me, would you like prompt me or lead me, guide me, whatever, so that I know what to do? Like, like would, you, would you lead me? Because that's one of the reasons he's given to us, to guide us and lead us. A lot of times we don't know it, so we don't tap into it. He wants to guide us in the decisions we're making. And if we let him guide us, don't you think our decisions are going to be great in life? Oftentimes when we're letting him guide us, for sure they will be. He convicts us, guides us, and he changes our desires. He changes our desires. What a lot of people find, maybe 500 of you at least from last weekend, what a lot of people find when they commit their life to Christ is that all of a sudden their desires are like shifted. Like, whereas I didn't even want to go to church before, now I can't get enough. I'm there every time the doors are open. I want to read my Bible. Like, I'm, I'm going to read my Bible all the time. I want to pray on a regular basis. I want to share Jesus with people that I know. I, I want to change the world. I mean, that's a, that's a change in desire, isn't it? Because we hadn't always had that desire. Holy Spirit, God himself, comes, takes up residence in our lives. All of a sudden, our desires kind of start to change. and we're, we're hungry. I see this all the time in people even here that commit their lives to Christ. It's like they'll call us, email us, whatever. They can't get enough. Like, what's my next step? What can I do next? What does God want me to do here? Hey, how can I do? I mean, just, just hungry, right? Because God himself takes up residence in our life. He changes our desires. He convicts us. He leads us. He guides us. So when we commit our lives to Christ, the Bible teaches, we become new people. Take a look at this next scene. Point number two is this. Just as Jake's legs were healed, remember he was crippled, when he was transformed into this avatar body, just as his legs uh, were healed when he was transformed in a similar way, point two, when we commit our lives to Christ, we will be healed either in this life or the next. When we commit our life to Christ, whatever it is we're suffering from or had friends that have suffered from cancer, whatever it may be, if we're crippled, whatever, Bible makes it clear when you commit your life to Christ, God will heal you either in this life, sometimes it happens in this life, or for sure in the next. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about this. Romans 8, he talks about how one day we're going to receive a new body. Like the Bible talks about this, you can re read up about it. We're going to receive a new body that's free from suffering, no longer prone to, to, to death and, and decay. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, John records this. He's speaking about what's, what it's going to be like one day, which is just such great news. John says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. You and I know there's a lot of suffering in our world today, is there not? And there's an outcry all across our world for the suffering to be over with. And the Bible makes it clear here that for the believer, one day it's going to be gone forever. Like we can have that hope, like it's going away, doesn't last forever. We'll be healed either in this life or the next from any suffering that we've had to deal with in this life. See, sometimes it does happen, healing does happen, whether it's cancer or somebody's a cripple or, or whatever. It, sometimes it happens in this life, but if it doesn't, according to the Bible, we can have hope that it will in the next couple of stories, uh, my dad and mom were telling me about this. 
a couple weeks ago, a lady came to Monday night prayer. Monday night prayer, 715, right in here, we pray. I'm telling you, if you want to know why things have happened here, 715 Monday night, you should come. We pray. Afterwards, there's prayer teams around the front. You can come up for prayer. This lady did. She came up to my mom and dad. And she uh, uh, came up to him and said, she was heartbroken, obviously, and she said, went to the doctor this week, and I've been diagnosed with cancer. Would you pray for me? My mom and dad, put their hands on her shoulders, pray for her here, right here at the front, Monday night prayer. The next weekend, Saturday, my dad, you see him out in the parking lot, usually parking cars. Next Saturday, she comes up to him ecstatic, ecstatic in the parking lot here at Experience Life. And she said, you won't believe, you know, you know how we pray like the doctors told me I had cancer? You know how we pray? I went back and they told me I'm now cancer free. Like sometimes, yeah, thank God for that. He's a healer. Sometimes that happens in this life. Not, not always though, it, it did for her. Not always, like my daughter, I've told you about her before. McKinley, my oldest, has a heart condition. We've been praying for her healing for a long time. Have not seen it yet, but I have hope that she commits her life to Christ and becomes a follower of Jesus, that even if God doesn't heal her in this life, she'll be healed in the next. There'll be no more suffering or death or sorrow or crying or, or, or pain for her in the next. So I tell you this, the Bible tells us we should pray for healing. You got a friend that's suffering, you got a family member suffering, you pray that God would heal them. Sometimes it's gonna happen, sometimes. But what's even more important than that is you make sure they know Jesus. You make sure they have a relationship with him because then they can know for sure whether it happens in this life or not, it will. It's gonna happen. They're gonna be healed. God is still a, still a healer. He wasn't just a healer back then. He's still a healer today. And ultimately, for those that have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will all one day be healed from whatever it is we're suffering from. So when we commit our lives to Christ, Bible teaches clearly, we will be healed either in this life, sometimes it's in this life, or the next. Take a look at this next scene. Point number three, when Jake was transformed and he took on his avatar body, he had greater ability in that avatar, in that body, than he did in his other body, right? He was crippled. He had greater ability in the avatar than he did in his other body. In the same way, when we commit our lives to Christ, you can mark this down, this is true biblically. Number three, when we commit our lives to Christ, God gives us power. When we commit our lives to Christ, Bible teaches this, God gives us power. Here's what it says. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says this. He says, but you will receive, what's that word? Power. So that's, that's me and you, right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. When does the Holy Spirit come on you? You commit your life to Christ. Receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if you missed the series, you can do it in January. You need to check that out. But basically, we talked about this verse for a couple of, of weekends, and man, I, I thought, you know, a lot of people were challenged to do some things they never would have dreamed they could have done previously. But according to this verse, we're, we're going to receive power. And you don't need power to do the possible. You need power to do the what? Right. You ever thought about that? Why does he give us power? To do the possible? Nope. You don't need power to do the possible. You need power to do the impossible. So the challenge in that series, and you can do it, was attempt the impossible for Jesus because he's enabled you to accomplish the impossible for Jesus. Like you've been given, like I've been given, according to the Bible, power, those of us that have committed our lives to Christ. So you ask the question then, well, how, how do we, like power to do what? Like power in what way? A couple of things. Number one, Bible makes it clear that God wants to answer our prayers. You heard that before? A lot of times we pray going, I'm not sure God still answers prayer. Guess what? He does. He wants to answer our prayer. So the question is, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've committed your life to Christ, do you pray expecting God to answer your prayers? Because if you don't, and I would say most of us probably don't, you should. James chapter 5 makes it clear that the prayer of a righteous person, somebody who's in Christ received his righteousness, is powerful and what? Effective. The prayer of a righteous person, somebody who's a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, is in right relationship with him, is powerful and effective. The Bible's saying that, that your prayers, that my prayers, that they can be powerful. So guess what? We don't wanna waste the power God's given us, do we? If he's given us power by causing his Holy Spirit to come and take up residence in our lives, we don't wanna waste the power he's given us. So this is, this is so, so important. I think you and I, those of us that are followers of Christ, on a regular basis, need to be asking our friends how we can pray for them. We need to be asking our family members, coworkers, neighbors, how we can pray for them. 
Why? Because God has given us power to be effective in prayer. He doesn't always say yes. Sometimes he says no. That's the answer to the prayer is no. But a lot of the times, the Bible's saying your prayers will be effective. The answer will be yes. I, Facebook, I do the Facebook thing. Facebook people, who does Facebook? Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, cool. Let's be, let's be friends. Anyways, so uh, Facebook, I got a relative on Facebook, and she, she's not a believer, almost positive that that's the case. And I, I've Facebooked her a couple of times and just said, hey, if I can ever pray for you, let me know. If I can ever pray for you, let me know. I wasn't going to pressure her to come to a church or, you know, whatever. I mean, I was kind of look for my next step in my relationship with this relative. So if I can ever pray for you, let me know. She Facebooked me uh, back uh, probably a couple months after I sent her that. And she said, hey, I, I need you to pray for me, which was surprising to me because, again, I didn't think she probably thought there was power in prayer. But she said, I need you to pray for me. I've got a friend. She's on life support. She's not going to make it. Doctors told her she's not going to make it. I don't you know, know about all this, she said, but would you pray for me? Did I pray for her and her friend? You better believe it. Not only did I pray that her friend would be healed, that was according to God's will, but I also prayed that through it, God would draw this relative to himself and that she would begin to believe in the power of prayer, that God is active and wants a relationship uh, with us. So a uh, couple, probably a month or, or so after that point, I Facebooked her back and said, hey, what about your friend? She, she passed away. And she says, you're not going to believe this. Of course, this isn't surprising you. You're not going to believe this. I mean, I know I asked you to pray and all this kind of crazy. You don't believe this. But she's made a full recovery. Like the doctors told her she wasn't going to make it. She made a full recovery. That's all she said. And I can't imagine what she was thinking. She's probably going, oh, my gosh. Like, I need to get some Christians praying for me on a regular basis or something or praying for, praying for things going on in my life because this must work or something. I'm not even sure about that. But the doctors told her their friend wasn't going to make it. And all she knew was somebody was praying for her and for her friend, and she makes a full recovery. What's up with that? My hope, thankful for her friend, my hope is that through that she comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ and believes that God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us power and wants to give her power as well. So he, uh, he answers our prayers. Second thing is he helps us to be effective in sharing the good news about Christ with other people. All right. Not just helping us like with the words to say, but like helping us according to Acts 1-8 to be effective in talking to people so much so that some will be compelled to believe because of the words he does give us. I mean, how cool would it be to think that you and I could be talking to a friend or family member or whoever that doesn't believe, that has some questions, they ask us those questions, God gives us the words to say, but more than that, effectiveness in saying them, they're compelled by our answers, and as a result, they commit their lives to Christ. I mean, every one of you would raise your hand and go, I'd like, to, I'd like to be part of that, that'd be pretty sweet. The reason most of us aren't is not because we don't have the answers to the questions. The reason most of us aren't is because we're not engaging in those conversations and allowing that power to operate through us and work through us. I mean, how many of us would love to be in a conversation with somebody, share the good news about Jesus with them, and have the opportunity to lead them to Christ because they're compelled by the words that we've shared to right there in that moment give their life to Jesus? Every one of you would be like, dude, I'd love to see it. Acts 1-8, baby. He said, by the Holy Spirit, he's given us power to have that kind of effectiveness in sharing with people the good news about Jesus. But you know what? A lot of us are wasting that power. A lot of us are wasting that power. Another thing is that he gives us a spiritual gift, the Bible says. Like, he especially gifted you in a certain way to advance his mission in this world, to serve his church and advance his mission. He's given you and me at least one, sometimes several, spiritual gifts. The Bible talks about this. Special kind of empowerings or an empowerment to, to do what he's called us to do in service to our church and in his mission in this world. I mean, that's incredible. Yet too often, I think, for myself and for maybe all of us, we're wasting the power that's been given to us when the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in our hearts because we had committed our lives to Christ. So, according to the Bible, when we commit our lives to Christ, God gives us power. Remember that. Remember that. One more scene. Take a look. So, point four. By the end of the movie, it's pretty obvious that Jake preferred his new life to his old one, right? Like he wanted to permanently be a part of this Navi people. Well, in a, in a similar way, when we commit our lives to Christ, point four, we find that our new life is more fulfilling than our old life. When you commit your life to Christ, you're going to find that your new life is more fulfilling 
than your old life. The Bible says this in John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus said, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life, rich like fulfilling, like a fulfilling and satisfying life. Here's the deal. Once you and I experience the satisfying life, it's kind of hard to want to go back to the unsatisfying one. I mean, who wants to go back to the unsatisfying life when you experience the life that's truly satisfying? Who wants to go back to the unsatisfying life when you realize that John 10, 10 is true, namely that when we're walking away from God or following ourselves, we're ultimately following somebody who's trying to get us to walk away from God and his purpose for our life is to steal from us, to kill us, and to destroy our lives. Who, who wants to be a part of that? Who, who, who would choose that plan for their life? I'm going after the one where my life's gonna be destroyed. Thank you very much. I mean, that, that's what you realize when you start to understand the Bible. That's, that's what you realize. That's, that's the direction that you're heading in when you choose to walk away from God. And so as often as I'm tempted to do that, as a pastor, am I still tempted to sin in certain ways? You better believe I am. You are too. So whether it's to say an unkind, I'm tempted to say an unkind thing to my wife or to act selfishly or pridefully or however it is that I'm tempted. You know what I start to remind myself of? This verse. And you know what I think to myself? I think this. When I'm being tempted to go this direction and it seems kind of oh, like this could be a cool thing, I start asking myself the question, so Chris, do you want to destroy your life? So Chris, do you want to destroy your marriage? So you, you, want, to, you want to just wreck everything? Is that, does that sound really good to you? Because what you're fixing to choose is what the Bible calls a path of destruction. And the Bible says, he who sows to the sinful nature will reap destruction. So is, is that what you want for your life, Chris? You, you want destruction for your life? And I'm reminded, no, I, uh, I'm not going to be deceived anymore. I've been deceived a long time. I'm not falling for it again. I'm following Jesus. I know he wants what's best for me. I'm following him. I'm taking the rich and satisfying life over the deception of the enemy who's ultimately trying to steal from me and destroy my life. The Bible makes it clear when we commit our lives to Christ, we find that our new life is more fulfilling than our old life. So when we commit our lives to Christ, amazing things happen, right? Like we become new people. We're prom we get this promise of healing sometimes in, in this life, but for sure one day for every believer. We receive power, and then we've got a more fulfilling life than what we had before, it's, it's, it's amazing. So if you've committed your life to Christ, maybe you did it last weekend, maybe 10 years ago, 30 years ago, you got a lot to look forward to. Don't waste the power God's given you. Remember, God has taken up residence in your life. That's an amazing thing. Don't miss out on that. But if you haven't committed your life to Christ, we don't want you to miss out. We recognize that there were some of you here last weekend, you had the card in your hand, you were looking at box one and you were thinking, I need to check this. I need to commit my life to Christ. No, I'm not sure I want to. No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about today. And you're back again. And right now, in this moment, you're looking at me. God is drawing you to himself right now. I just want you to know today's your day. There's another opportunity. God's still holding out his arm saying, come on. Come on. Commit your life to me. I'll save you, fill you with the Holy Spirit and do great things in your life. The Bible says this, Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Verse nine. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he, Jesus, watch this, will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Which you and I deserve. We talked about this last week and it's God's condemnation. If we get what we deserve one day, it's not a heaven. Who are we kidding? God's a good judge. He's gonna punish those that break his law. I've broken his law, so have you. So I deserve God's condemnation, but Jesus came and died for me rose from the dead so I wouldn't have to experience it. The Bible says there's no condemnation for anybody that's in Christ. If you put your trust in him, that, that goes away. Penalty for your sin, fine, all that that God is you know, requiring of us is paid by Jesus and what he did for us. And all he's asking of us, not that we do something, but that we make a decision to trust him. Not ourselves, not our good works to get us to heaven. Oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. That ain't going to get you there to trust in him and believe Jesus, you're the way. I get God's condemnation without you. With you, you've taken it for me. And so I get eternal life. And it's about just saying in your heart, Jesus, I commit my life to you. Jesus, I commit my life to you. And today can be a new day for you. And all of this that we've talked about here 
can be the case for you walking out of this place today. What's keeping you today? What's keeping you today from making that decision? If you do, the band's gonna continue in worship here in a second. Just check on this card, this connection card is attached to your program. I'm committing my life to Christ. Put in a box on the way out. We'd love to pray for you. Know, know that you're making that decision. If you take it, put it in a box, or you can take it to our uh, Next Step Center, actually, which is over here. We'd love to give you a Bible. Nice leather Bible, you get your name engraved. Just as our way of saying, hey, this will help you start the journey. Read this, apply it to your life. Give you that opportunity right now. Pray with me, if you will. Some of you need to pray today. Your prayer needs to be, Jesus, I commit my life to you. Would you pray that? Right now, Jesus, I commit my life to you. My life is yours. I want to be right with you today. Jesus, I commit my life to you. Save me from God's condemnation. I deserve it. I'm trusting you to save me from it right now in this moment. You pray that prayer, you can know for sure your sins are forgiven. you got eternal life. You're right with God. Don't resist Him any longer. And God, for the believers in the room, pray we wouldn't waste the power. Pray we'd realize the Holy Spirit is within us. And He can guide us, lead us, if we'll let Him into a rich and satisfying life. Thank you for this word from you and for your scriptures that we read from, learn from, and apply to our lives. In Jesus' name. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.